Um, so I know we've got people joining us from all over the place, and I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us here today. Um, my name is Evan Smith. Actually, you can't see me right now. Let me turn on my video. There we go. Hopefully you can see me now. So my name is Evan Smith. I'm a researcher with GIA, and I've been with GIA for about five years. Uh, my background is in geology. So when I look at diamonds, I see them as a, a natural piece of the earth. And I look at them through the lens of geology. Uh, and I've looked at a lot of diamonds in the past few years, and I've learned a lot about them. So hopefully I can share some of that perspective with you today. So I'm going to be talking about the unique story of natural diamonds. As I said, I'm a geologist. You all know geologists like rocks. Here's a rock for you. It's gray. It's lumpy. Uh, it's pretty unremarkable. And I think if you saw this on the street, you probably wouldn't think twice. and You might even kick it aside. But what if I told you that this rock was actually collected in 1972 from way up there in the sky? This is actually a piece of rock that was collected during Apollo 17. That's the most recent mission to the lunar surface, a manned mission to the lunar surface. And this is one of the rocks we collected. So just that tidbit of information takes this from being just a, an unremarkable rock to being a piece of the moon. And little bits of information like that really help us change our perspective when it comes to uh, natural materials around us. So let's take a look at diamonds now. And this is something I get asked a lot, like what's so great about diamond? What makes a diamond special? Uh, some of the things that we often talk about are the hardness. Diamond is the hardest natural substance that we know of. Uh, it's got other great properties too. It's, a, it's an excellent thermal conductor and it's very resistant to scratching and bruising it's got a high index of refraction it can separate light into its spectral colors so when it's cut and polished it really makes a beautiful gemstone so its natural properties make it great as a gem material we also know it's relatively rare this is something you probably haven't found wandering around outside um, but there are people spending millions and millions of dollars every year trying to find new diamond deposits. So relatively, it's a rare commodity. We also know that diamond is something that's valuable. It has a very high price tag on it, and it has a, a great value for industrial purposes as well. It's also got a lot of symbolism tied to it. This is something that we expect as a gift sometimes at very special occasions, especially engagements, and diamond is viewed as a symbol of enduring love. And these are all things that you're probably familiar with, things that we attribute to diamonds, and they are part of what makes diamonds special. Uh, but just like the rock, I'd like to take a look at the story behind diamonds. I think this is something that adds to this discussion and in a way provides a bit of a new context for the appreciation of these natural materials. Almost 2,000 years ago, Pliny the Elder said that diamond is the most valuable, not only of precious stones, but of all things in this world. And as a scientist, I think this is true. I think he was probably referring to its application as an industrial material, uh, but it's been recognized for a long time that diamond is valuable beyond its use as a gemstone. And diamonds are a, a mineral, but they're really a unique mineral. So a mineral is something that has a definite chemical composition. In the case of diamond, it's composed of carbon, it's just carbon atoms. And they're arranged in a particular uh, crystal structure. So a mineral has to have a symmetrical repeating crystal structure to it. And you can see the crystal structure of diamond here. And a mineral has to be something that's naturally occurring. There are minerals all around us and rocks like i showed earlier they're all made up of minerals so there's lots and lots of natural materials we can find around us and a lot of these are minerals some of them are precious gemstone minerals and for the most part all of these things that we can see and touch formed at relatively shallow depths in the earth in the crust though so maybe as deep as a few tens of kilometers down in the earth all of these rubies and sapphires and opals, et cetera, 
They're all relatively shallow minerals in comparison to diamond. Diamond is completely exotic in this sense because it's formed much, much deeper in the earth. And this is one of the big things that makes diamonds a unique mineral. So if we look at the earth, another cross section here, kind of zoomed out, we're looking at the whole globe now, and we can see the crust of the earth. And that's where most of the things, the rocks and minerals we can see and touch form. And we're saying that diamonds form deeper down in the earth than that. And that's one of the things that makes them special. So diamonds form deep in the earth, beneath the crust. Most of them form in the base of the oldest and the thickest parts of continents at depths of about 150 to 200 kilometers. That's very common for most diamonds. But rarely we've found that some diamonds actually form even deeper in the earth, beyond about 200 kilometers, maybe even as deep as the boundary between the mantle and the core. Now, this is an area of ongoing research, but we know for sure that in this sense of depth, diamond is truly an exotic natural material. So when you pick up a diamond like this, I had the pleasure of examining this diamond. It's beautiful, it's sparkly, uh, people go wide-eyed when you tell them the price tag, but it's also a really special natural sample of the earth because it is something that comes from such an extreme depth. So where do diamonds come from? We just said that diamonds form very deep in the earth and most of them come from this depth of around 150 to 200 kilometers deep. Here's an example of a diamond mine. This is in Northern Canada. This is the Diavik diamond mine. We've got a couple open pits here and they're digging down into the earth. These are deep pits and there are even underground workings beneath these pits, extending a few hundred meters. But this is nowhere near the depth of, of where these diamonds that they're recovering, where those diamonds actually formed. So it begs the question, how did these diamonds actually get so close to surface that we can mine them? And the answer is kimberlites, or sometimes uh, related volcanic eruptions that are similar to kimberlites. These are very explosive and energetic volcanic eruptions. We've never actually seen one erupt during our lifetime, uh, but we were sort of piecing together some of the evidence of how they work based on studying the, the kimberlite rock itself and the diamonds that are contained within it. So these kimberlite eruptions might look something like this, this very energetic explosion that comes from depths probably beyond 200 kilometers. And during its journey up to surface, it's breaking up pieces of rocks and, and training little mineral grains in it and sweeping this material up to surface. So diamonds are sort of an accidental passenger in this eruption that brings material to surface. So we find diamonds entrained in these volcanic eruptions as accidental passengers. So they've been removed very far from the place where they formed. And this makes it very challenging to build up our understanding of how and where diamonds form, where they actually crystallize. A lot of the information that we know now comes from studying not only the diamonds, but we've learned a lot from studying inclusions in diamond. So down at the bottom here, we've got a, a section through the earth. Let me turn on my laser pointer. There we go. There, so we've got a section through the earth. Remember, we're living up here and most of the things we can see and touch are restricted to the crust. Here's a diamond forming maybe at 150 to 200 kilometers deep and it's growing, and as it grows, perhaps it will envelop some other mineral grain, and that can become trapped in the diamond. So that's an inclusion. And now when this diamond is swept to surface in a volcanic eruption, we have this piece of material up at the surface of the earth that we can cut and polish and admire as a gemstone, but it also can contain this little physical sample from very deep in the earth. And this inclusion means that diamonds carry extremely valuable information within them. And the diamond is surprisingly good at preserving these materials for all the same reasons that it's a good gemstone. It's very hard and durable. 
and it actually has a very good ability to prevent things from diffusing or leaking out of it or anything leaking or diffusing into it. So the diamond has inclusions that are extremely well preserved. And that means that we've got these little tiny snapshots from way down deep in the earth and sometimes billions of years in the past that have just been waiting there, frozen in time. They're a great opportunity to learn about the earth. And when you look at natural diamonds out there, you can see a, a very broad array of different sizes and shapes and colors. And there's just as much variability in the inclusions inside those diamonds. There's a tremendous amount of information captured by all of these diamonds. And what we've learned from studying diamonds over the course of many decades is that there are multiple different ways diamonds can form. As we said earlier, most diamonds come from around 150 to 200 kilometers deep, and some crystallize even deeper in the earth. And in all of those settings, you can have multiple different kinds of fluid that's bearing the carbon, so carbon bearing fluid, and different kinds of rocks that are involved. So it's like Mother Nature has different recipes to make diamonds. Now, this is what uh, diamond formation event might look like. So we, we know we've got multiple different ways that diamonds can form, and this is one potential variation. So we're looking at a slice of a rock here. We've got these green minerals here, of olivine and pyroxene, and we've got these little purple grains. These are garnets. Now, I said something about fluid and carbon-bearing fluid, and we think that in most cases, Diamonds form by carbon that crystallizes out of a fluid. So imagine a fluid, like a watery substance, leaking into this rock, penetrating upward between these grain boundaries. And with every pulse of fluid, you have more carbon introduced into this system. And in some cases, there can be a trigger that causes carbon to crystallize out of that fluid. So here's another pulse of fluid and we've started forming diamonds. And you can see one of these diamonds is actually enveloped or entrained uh, a mineral grain from this rock. So that's an inclusion now, a garnet inclusion. If this diamond were swept up to surface, we could study that inclusion and learn something about this rock, where the diamond formed and the, the time and place where the diamond growth event occurred. So by studying inclusions, we can learn a little bit about the carbon-bearing fluids the diamonds form from, and the different kinds of rocks that they form in. And here's a couple examples of some common mineral inclusions. So on the left here, we've got a diamond, and we're this is a cut and polished diamond. We're looking down through a microscope, and we can see a, a blue crystal there. That's a, an inclusion of kyanite. And then off to the left, in the little corner there, is an orange inclusion of garnet. And together, these minerals tell us that the, the host rock where this diamond grew was a, a rock called eclogite. On the right here, we've got another example of an inclusion. In this case, it's a little colorless inclusion, and this is olivine. And in this case, the host rock where this diamond grew down deep in the mantle was something we call a peridotite. So by studying lots and lots of inclusions, we have a pretty good idea of how most diamonds form. And that place uh, where we said most diamonds form, uh, about 150 to 200 kilometers deep in the earth, that corresponds to this environment of the, the oldest and thickest parts of continents. And that would be right here. So in these old, thick sort of roots or keels of the continents, the temperatures are a little bit cooler and the pressure is high enough that diamond is the stable form of carbon here. Now, these continents are also called lithosphere and this is the continental lithosphere. This is sort of the rigid tectonic plate at the top of the earth. And diamonds that form in this environment in the lithospheric or cratonic keel, these are called lithospheric diamonds. And that distinguishes them from diamonds that form even deeper in the sub-lithospheric mantle. Sometimes we call those diamonds super deep diamonds. And again, we have an idea of where they form because of the inclusions that they contain in our studies of those inclusions. So back to this guy I showed earlier, this large diamond here, 
Uh, this is something that we've studied in the past few years, and now we actually know that a lot of diamonds like this, these very high quality, large type 2A diamonds, these are actually super deep diamonds. And this is something that we've just learned in the past few years. So it takes this diamond from being a, a beautiful, sparkling piece of jewelry with this astounding price tag, but it adds to the story now that we know that this diamond probably came from about 600 kilometers below our feet. Like this is a tremendous depth and a tremendous journey for this diamond to have taken to come from that depth all the way up to surface. And eventually we are so lucky to, to find it and polish it into this beautiful gemstone. So I just talked about the depth of diamond formation, but something that's very familiar in the, the sort of hype around diamond is the age of diamonds quite often stated that many diamonds are three billion years old. So in this slide, we've got a time scale here and time is increasing from left to right. So at the very beginning of the time scale, this is the beginning of the earth around 4.6 or 4.5 billion years ago. So 4.5 GA, G is uh, like a prefix like, um, like a metric prefix, like we use gigabytes for billion bytes. Well, this is giga annum for billion years. So the age of the earth is about four and a half billion years old. Some of the rocks, the oldest rocks that we can find on the surface of the earth are around four to 4.3 billion years old. And not much younger than that, we have some of the oldest diamonds that are around three and a half billion years old in a couple deposits from Northern Canada, from Ekati and Diabek. And there are um, a whole range of different diamond ages. And these are ages that have been measured by studying uh, the sort of radiometric decay sequence of inclusions inside diamonds. So this is something that's very difficult to do, but we've measured a lot of diamonds over the years. And we have a pretty good idea of the spread of different diamond ages. So this scale here is going from the beginning of the Earth all the way up to 2 billion years ago. In the next slide, we're going from 2 billion years ago all the way up to present day. So we can see that we've still got some younger diamond formation events. For instance, a lot of the pink diamonds like we have at Argyle, uh, a lot of those diamonds formed around 1.6 billion years ago. But there are younger diamonds too. Uh, for, instance, for instance, in the uh, Sierra Leone at the Zimi diamond mine locations. We've got younger diamonds that are around 650 MA. So now we've gone from GA, billion annum, to MA, mega annum. Just like megabyte, this is a million bytes or a million annum, a million years. So we've got diamonds that are younger than a billion years that are 650 million years old. And to sort of put this in perspective, I've got here around 200 million years ago, this is when the Atlantic Ocean opened up. Prior to this, we had the supercontinent Pangaea, and around 200 million years ago, that continent broke up and the Atlantic Ocean opened up. Another thing we've got on here is uh, the age of dinosaurs going extinct. That was 65 million years ago. So that looks pretty young on this time scale. And then even younger than that, right at the tip of the arrow, that would sort of be towards present day, we've got, you know, the emergence of uh, Homo sapiens is probably something that's occurred within the last 300 or 200,000 years. So we've learned a lot about diamonds by studying the inclusions and we have an idea of how deep they form and how old they are. We know that diamonds are extraordinarily deep compared to almost everything else around us that we can see and and some diamonds are extremely old, in some cases, three and a half billion years old, which is almost as old as the Earth itself at 4.6 billion years old. So diamonds and the inclusions within them are, in a scientific sense, an extremely valuable sample of the Earth. And I really like this uh, cover of science here. This is from one of my papers from about three and a half years ago. And they added this little blurb here saying that diamonds are a geologist's best friend. I think that's probably true, just because they're so valuable from an earth science perspective. 
we've learned a lot about the Earth from studying diamonds. We've learned things about continent formation, the tectonic plate activity through time, the movement of deep carbon inside the Earth, the movement of other materials inside the Earth besides carbon. And we've learned about the composition and heterogeneity of the Earth's mantle, the interior of our planet. Let's look at a few examples of some of these things we've learned. And I'd like to start off with plate tectonics. A lot of people have heard something about plate tectonics. This is the idea that the surface of the Earth is made up of rigid plates, and the boundaries between the plates are where we have earthquakes. So the plates bump up against one another, and we have the shaking events like earthquakes. So that's what we see at the surface of the Earth, these plates that rub up against one another. But if we look at this in cross-section, cross-section through what is happening with these plates, it might look something like this. So now you can see that we've got dry land or continents, and those are continental plates, and we can distinguish those from the oceanic plates. So the plates that underlie the world's oceans are a little bit different in their composition, and they're a little bit different in their fate. So we have dry land, the continents, that sort of sits around for billions of years, but the ocean plates, there's something that are created at these divergent margins in the middle of oceans, at mid-ocean ridges. You know, mid-ocean ridges create new oceanic plate, and then that material diverges and eventually undergoes a process called subduction, where it sinks back into the Earth at a plate boundary. And this is an underlying principle of, of plate tectonics, not just that we have plates moving around, but that these plates, especially ocean plates, are being uh, created and sinking back down into the Earth in this cycle. So you can imagine that this is something that's been going on for a long time. We said that the Atlantic Ocean opened about 200 million years ago, but there have been cycles of this kind of activity many times through Earth's history. But this has to have started at some point. There has to be a start to this cycle. Before that time, there was no um, modern convection like this where you have oceanic plates being created and subducted and destroyed. And we can learn something about this um, by studying diamonds. So before we move on, we'll just go back to these two rock types we were talking about earlier, peridotite and eclogite. So peridotite is something that's very, very common inside the Earth, in the Earth's mantle. And that's something that underlays most continents and the rock beneath those continents. And the other rock type we looked at that we see inclusions of this rock type inside some diamonds is eclogite. And eclogite is the metamorphic equivalent of basalt. So when you take basalt, which is what the ocean crust is made up of, so this uppermost layer of that ocean plate, the ocean crust, if you take that and sink that down into the earth, it sort of gets cooked and the rock type changes from basalt to eclogite. That's called metamorphism. It's changing its mineral content, but it's still overall the same composition. So we've got these two rock types that are really important inside the Earth, peridotite and eclogite. And again, we've got these mineral inclusions that correspond to those different rock types, and we see diamonds that have grown in these two different rock types. So if we take a tally now of some of these different inclusions that we see, we start counting up the different kinds of inclusions we're seeing and how frequently we're seeing them. For instance, these orange eclogitic garnets or these red and purplish garnets that come from peridotite. If we make a tally of those, um, we can say something about how diamonds relate to plate tectonics. Diamonds tie into our ideas of when plate tectonics started. So like I said, um, by examining the inclusions in many, many diamonds and identifying the mineral inclusions that are there in those inclusions, and we break that down into eclogite and peridotite host rocks. Let me get my pointer back here. So on the, on the right hand side here, we've got a diagram 
with geologic time running in the vertical axis. So this is, you know, 3.8 or 3,850 million years ago. And that goes all the way up to 65 million years ago and then present day at the top. So time is, time is getting younger up towards the top. Now I want you to pay attention to the, the rightmost part here. We've got ages of diamonds and these diamonds are broken up into eclogitic and peridotitic. Again, these are determinations we make based on the mineral inclusions inside them. Say we find kyanite, well, we would call that an eclogitic um, diamond. Say we find some olivine inclusions, well, that's probably a peridotitic diamond. Now, if we look at the ages of those diamonds, so there are some sporadic ages here and here, and eclogitic diamonds that range from you know, a thousand all the way back to you know 2700 million years ago there's a, a break here where eclogitic diamonds have been found all the way back to this red line and then earlier than that earlier than about three billion years ago the only diamonds that we could find were peridotitic diamonds so prior to three billion years ago there weren't any eclogitic diamonds so eclogitic diamonds only appear after, after about three billion years ago. And our idea is that plate tectonics may have started around three billion years ago. And this is when we started carrying those oceanic plates down into the earth. Remember that oceanic crust is the rock type that gives us these eclogitic inclusions. And we didn't see any of these appearing within the rock record until about 3 billion years ago. So back to this diagram, what we're saying is that these, um, these diamonds that tell us there's eclogite in the mantle, we didn't see any of these diamonds appearing until about 3 billion years ago. And earlier than that, the only diamonds that we see in the record are peridotitic. So the idea is that from the perspective of diamonds, it looks like plate tectonics, this modern style of convection activity here, might have actually started around 3 billion years ago. And this is um, what we see. We see subducted oceanic crust that gives us this eclogite. This is something that appears in the diamond record after 3 billion years ago. And that's really interesting that diamonds have this time stamp in them. When you look at the inclusions, they tell you something about the bigger picture of the operation of the Earth. This idea of plate tectonics and mantle convection, we can say something about when it started from the perspective of diamonds. Now, the other thing I'd like to talk about here is that you've got material being subducted into the Earth that actually recycles, it carries material from the surface of the Earth down into the Earth. So sometimes we can link diamonds with subduction. We can link diamonds with material that looks like it, it would have been at the surface of the earth long ago. So diamonds show evidence of material being carried from earth's surface down into the mantle. And the example I want to talk about here is carbon. The perspective of carbon, specifically the isotopes of carbon. So carbon is an element. And when you look at an atom of carbon, its nucleus has a certain number of protons and neutrons. And it's the number of protons that make it a carbon atom. And you can add a neutron or take away a neutron, and it's still a carbon atom. That's what's happening here with carbon-12 and carbon-13. So these are both carbon. They have the same number of protons. They have the same chemical behavior, but they have a slightly different weight. These are called isotopes. So these are two different isotopes of carbon. And chemical reactions happening in the Earth sometimes can change the ratio of 12 and 13 carbon that you have in a system. When you look inside the Earth, if we look at the, the carbon that we see coming out of the Earth, most, most of it is um, got a ratio of 12 and 13 carbon that places it around minus 0.5 on this scale here. It's called delta 13C. So this is taking a measure of the proportion of carbon 12 and carbon 13 that we have. And if you go 
at minus five, that's where most of the carbon inside the Earth is sitting. And heavier than that, if you go to bigger numbers, you get up to zero. And lighter than that means going to more negative numbers down towards all the way down to negative 40 here so back to this idea of the inclusions in diamonds if we break diamonds down into peridotite and eclogite remember eclogite are the ones that look like they have something to do with ocean crust that's been subducted down into the earth what you can see is that these eclogitic diamonds have this tail over towards more negative carbon isotope values so there's a peak over here at minus five, where you have a lot of carbon that's just sort of floating around in the mantle. But you have a lot of values as well that are tailing off towards lighter and lighter carbon isotope values. And the most popular idea to explain this is that you've got multiple different sources of carbon being involved. You've got carbon that's just from the mantle that sits around minus five, but maybe you have contributions of other sources of carbon with different ratios of 12 and 13 carbon. And this tail of light carbon looks like it's probably something that's been subducted down into the Earth's mantle from the surface. This light carbon is thought to have something to do with organic carbon. And this could be actual life forms, like marine life. And this carbon has sunk down onto the oceanic plate and been subducted into the earth, but it could also have to do with inorganic, or, um, abiotic, sorry, organic carbon, things like methane and other hydrocarbons that form by processes that don't have anything to do with life. But in both cases, we're, we've got hydrocarbons or organic carbon that's been carried down from the surface of the earth and added to that inventory of carbon that's sitting around minus five. So when we look at the carbon isotopes of eclogitic diamonds, they tell us that you've got this kind of recycling in the carbon cycle. Material carbon specifically is being carried from the surface of the earth down into the earth. So that's pretty interesting that we can see that just from looking at diamonds. Now, when we're talking about recycling, in this sense, in looking at eclogitic and peridotitic diamonds, we're still talking about lithospheric diamonds. But I want to take a bit of a sidestep now and talk about some of the research we've done more recently that gets into super deep diamonds that include some of these very, very large and super high quality type 2A and type 2B diamonds that are colorless or even blue type 2B diamonds like the Hope Diamond. So these are things that have been featured on the, the cover of Science and Nature. These are papers that have come out in the past few years from the research that's gone on at, at GIA and in collaboration with many partners around the world. And that's specifically why I want to highlight it now, this idea of super deep diamonds and how they relate to some of the biggest and best diamonds, world-class diamonds that we know of. For many years, uh, the past few decades, it's, believed, it's been believed that super deep diamonds are extremely rare. They're something that we find predominantly in Brazil at a place called Juina, where we find a lot of super deep diamonds, but they're extremely rare worldwide. And it was believed that they can never be of gem quality. And quite often they're very, very small. And for many years, this was the prevailing idea of super deep diamonds, because that's all we had seen. These are the only diamonds that appear to be super deep. Uh, but in studying some of these larger and higher quality diamonds that are usually not available for research, but by studying some some of these particularly special high quality diamonds over the past four years we've found that many top quality diamonds like the cullinan diamond over here the largest gem quality diamond ever found uh, these diamonds are actually super deep so they're forming beneath the continental lithosphere in a place that's maybe three four five hundred kilometers deep or even more in some cases and this incorporates diamonds that we, we call clipper diamonds, and that's uh, these diamonds that are generally large and type 2A, so like the Cullinan diamond. And this also includes type 2B diamonds, like the Hope diamond. They're sometimes blue in color due to boron impurities that substitutes for those carbon atoms in the crystal structure. And we know that these are 
super deep diamonds, again, because of the inclusion. But in this case, we're talking about high pressure mineral inclusion. So let's go back to these inclusions we saw before. So these are inclusions that you find in these two rock types, but you find them in these two rock types at a particular depth. If you take these rocks, the peridotite and the eclogite, and you increase the pressure and temperature by bringing them deeper and deeper into the earth, the minerals that make up those rocks will change. They'll metamorphose and you'll get new minerals forming and some minerals will disappear. That's what's shown on this diagram here. So we've got depth on the vertical axis and we've got two different rock types here. Let me pull up my laser pointer. Two different rock types here. Uh, we've got eclogite or basaltic oceanic crust on the right, and we can see that's made up of these minerals, garnet and clinopyroxene. But if you take that rock and bring it down deeper and deeper into the earth, bring it down to 600 or maybe 800 kilometers, you can see that the garnet and clinopyroxene, they actually disappear and we have new minerals forming. These are very, very high pressure minerals that you only get at extremely uh, high pressures and temperatures. And if you find these minerals inside diamonds, they're an indication that they're coming from not the shallower depths of, of the lithosphere, but of much, much greater depths. So if we look at some of the inclusions that we actually found in some of these diamonds, this is what they look like. So here's an example of this uh, yellow phase here in the diagram called CAPV, that's calcium perovskite. We found examples of this mineral. We've also had examples of bridgmanite. And all of these minerals that I'm showing you, these have been found in type 2B diamonds. So diamonds that are similar in character to the Hope diamond. So we've got all these different high pressure minerals forming. And this tells us that the diamonds themselves must have come from this extremely high pressure environment, deeper than the depths of the lithosphere. Here's a, another view of some of these extremely high pressure mineral inclusions. And you can see sometimes they've actually exploded in a sense. They've got so much pressure locked up in them that they can rupture the diamonds surrounding them and spread out into the diamond a little bit. Then the whole thing can heal back up. So these inclusions have a tendency to look very messy and they can have cracks and little kind of droplet looking things around them. Quite often they're messy looking because of the tremendous amount of pressure involved. So just to touch a little bit more closely on type 2B diamonds, again, these are characterized by the presence of boron, dropped in blue in color. And here's the Hope Diamond. It's sort of the best example, most famous example, certainly, of a type 2B diamond. These are something that are very, very rare, uh, but we see them throughout uh, deposits around the world here. And they're unusual from a geological perspective because boron is something that's very enriched at the surface of the earth, but down inside the mantle, there's very, very little boron. So it's unusual to find boron in a diamond. And it begs the question, how did this boron get there in the first place? So I studied a lot of inclusions in type 2B diamonds. Here's one of them here. You can see some little specks of inclusions inside this diamond. And just like I showed in that previous diagram, we've got that diagram shrunken down here, and all the inclusions that we documented within these type 2B diamonds show us that the type 2B diamonds formed very deep in the earth, probably around 600 kilometers or maybe a little bit deeper, but also that they've got an affinity for oceanic crust and the underlying peridotitic part of that plate. So they're not only deep, they have a tie, a link in with subducted oceanic plates. And that immediately gives us an idea about where the boron might have come from. The idea is that the boron might have been carried down from the surface of the earth and incorporated into these diamonds as they were growing. So you can imagine this tectonic plate like a conveyor belt sinking into the earth and it can bring materials with it. We showed already that carbon can be transported into the earth, or maybe boron can be transported into the earth too. And there are lots of other elements that could also be recycled deeply into the earth. So that's what's 
uh, sort of summarized here is this idea of recycling of material. We've learned a lot from studying some of these super deep diamonds in terms of what can be recycled. And I'll just point out these red arrows. We've got carbonate or carbonated uh, melt that's coming out of some of these subducted slabs. And we've also gotten these blue area arrows uh, where it says breakdown of hydrous phases. So this is an important idea for the recycling, the idea that some of the materials that are being brought into the earth are inherently unstable. And once you heat them up and increase the pressure and temperature, they can melt or sort of get gooey or turn into a fluid and be squeezed out of the plate. And then you start getting chemical reactions happening. And one of the things that we're seeing is that diamonds are forming in some of these environments where there's a lot of material being transferred into the mantle. You've got temperature gradients, you've got fluids involved, you've got carbon. This is the perfect place for a lot of activity, one of these activities being diamond formation. So I hope the next time you look at diamonds, like these diamonds here, you'll see that they're special because of their beauty, uh, because of their symbolism, because of their rarity, but also because of the, the many stories behind some of these diamonds. We've seen that there are multiple different ways that natural diamond can form. And these diamonds turn out to be some of the most scientifically valuable samples of our planet. Uh, they can record things like plate tectonics. They can tell us about recycling of materials into the mantle. And we've also seen that some world-class diamonds, like the Cullinan diamond or the Hope diamond, some of these actually look like they've come from extreme depths. They're super deep diamonds. So I'd like you to think about this idea that every diamond tells a story from a place that we can't go and from a time long since past. Thank you so much for coming out today. I think now we can move into our question and answer session. Yes, thank you so much, Evan. This is incredible. This is all very informative. So we do have a few questions from the audience. One is, is there any way to identify where the carbon came from for the diamonds? In a sense, yes. So as I was talking about with the carbon isotopes, if you measure the ratio of carbon 12 and carbon 13 that makes up that diamond, you can get an idea of where the carbon comes from. If it comes from around minus five per mil, um, this is something that looks like the ambient carbon that we think is just sort of floating around in the mantle. But if it's something that's dramatically lighter, for instance, if it's minus 30 per mil, that would suggest that maybe this carbon is recycled. At least that's the popular thinking. But in more detail than that, we don't know exactly where the carbon comes from. This is just sort of a clue that, that fits into a, a broader model that's still evolving. Okay, great. So, so does that mean that all type two diamonds are super deep diamonds? No, no, that it doesn't quite mean that. The, the problem is that the type classification of diamonds is um, something that's meant to capture the nitrogen impurities in diamond, whether it's got nitrogen impurities or it doesn't. So type two just means that it doesn't have enough of these nitrogen impurities to register within infrared spectroscopy. So it looks like a very, very pure diamond, but that doesn't align perfectly with our understanding of diamond geology and where different diamonds form. So we think that there are actually a few different localities that different mantle environments that could produce diamonds that don't have measurable quantities of nitrogen. If you look at all diamonds and lump out just the type twos, then a big proportion of those might have formed the same way. But you can still have these oddballs that are technically type two, but aren't really part of that um, population. And I think you're getting at that population of super deep diamonds. So it's not a one-to-one -one correlation where you can say, this is type two, therefore it's super deep. You have to get into a little bit more detail and look at some of the additional geological features of every diamond. Okay, great. Uh, this will be the last question, and I will read it word from word. Uh, what was the carat weight and dimensions on that honker diamond you showed? 
The dimensions I'm unsure of. The weight, the carat weight was 163 carats. It was wow. a D-colored diamond, uh, emerald cut, one of the most beautiful diamonds I've ever held. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Both that size. Th those were my hands in the picture, so look <laughs> at my hands for scale. <laughs> Well, this was great. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much, Evan, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we have, uh, you know, this is the first of many GIA knowledge sessions that we have. Uh, the next one is coming up uh, just a week from now. So stay tuned for an invite for that. It'll be uh, Mike Breeding will be joining us to talk about uh, the identification uh, methods for uh, for lab laboratory grown diamonds. So uh, join us again next week and thank you all for, for joining. Thank you everyone. Thanks.